a very very good morning to all my lovely kids today we will be starting with class 7th history book r pass 2 and chapter for today is chapter number 7 tribes nomads and settled communities let's start with the chapter with the aims and objectives to convey an idea of long term social change and movements of people in this subcontinent we will understand political developments in specific areas we'll also get to know how anthropological studies inscriptions chronicles are used to write history we'll get to know about many tribes merged with the caste based societies and adopted hinduism we will learn about warren based societies interacted with different tribal societies and at last we'll get to know about new sub caste or jatis emerge with the earlier caste so let's start with our session with the introduction of this chapter so over different periods of time we have seen different type of developments and changes so just like that various political economic and social changes occurred in different different parts of the indian subcontinent with this different kind of societies evolved in different places they have emerged as per the different area and their culture the society was divided into four varn system first brahmins second kshatriyas third vaishyas and the fourth shudras let's just have a look to this varn system through a picture first one is the brahmin who have the knowledge of text and vedas they considered as the highest varn in our indian society second is the kshatriya they are the warriors who used to fought in the war and protect the people the last two are vaishya and the shudras due to this system which system varn system the difference between the classes and caste increased in the society now let's learn about tribal societies most of the tribes were dependent on agriculture as they lived in the forest and others were herders and hunter gatherers tribes are people who do not follow rules and regulation set by the society they combine these activities to make full use of the natural resources of the area in which they lived some tribes were nomadic and they used to move from one place to another as these people are completely dependent upon the nature and they lived in the forest so they always tried to make use of all the natural resources in their area a tribal group controlled land and pastures together and divided these among households according to its rule sometimes they clashed with the more powerful caste based societies but the caste based and the tribal societies also dependent on each other for their different different needs many tribes live in forest hills deserts and other places which were difficult to reach as in an ancient time the developed places were not possible to find out so even now also tribal people preferred to live in forest villages hills deserts etc they are the people who preserved their culture and heritage through oral tradition look at the picture carefully 
you can see how they are still preserving it and they have also preserved in our ancient past so who were tribal people contemporary historians and travelers from medieval india hardly give any information about the tribes and the rich customs and oral tradition which they used to preserve were passed to each and every new generation many of the tribes emerged as politically powerful group through their areas of influence and activities tribal people were found in almost every region of this subcontinent the area and influence of a tribe were different at different point of time some powerful tribes controlled large territories and some used to control small territories some of the powerful tribes were kokar tribe in punjab during 13th and 14th century it was one of the most powerful tribes ever exist in our ancient india later the ghakkars become more important their chief kamal khan ghakkar was made a noble mansabdar by the one of the greatest empire and the great emperor akbar the tribal societies underwent a change as a result of interaction with the hindu and islamic societies langs and arguns in multan gaddis in the himalayas these are other tribal society which were popularly famous in our ancient past apart from that the balochis were another large and powerful tribe in the northwest they were divided into many smaller clans under different chiefs chiefs means leader the mundas and santhals were the other important tribes that lived in this region and also in orissa and bengal you can have a look to these pictures and can have a idea how these tribal people from these communities exactly look like Kolis and Berats of Gujarat, Gonds of Chhattisgarh, Bheel tribe in Central India, etc. The Gonds were found in great numbers. Where present-day states of Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, and Andhra Pradesh, the large tribe of Bheels were spread across Western and Central India. By the late 16th century many of them had become settled agriculturalist and some even zamindars so have you seen with the passage of time they have developed themselves and turned into agriculturalist and in fact zamindars so it was a great achievement you can have a look to these different different states where these different tribal communities were found in our indian subcontinent the tribal societies underwent a change why with the interaction of with the hindus and islamic societies in many areas of present day bihar and jharkhand chero kingdom had emerged by the 12th century raja man singh Akbar's famous general attacked and defeated the Cheros in 1591. So how nomads and mobile people lived? So far we have discussed about their society, their group names, their culture, but how they exactly lived. So let's just learn about it. The pastoral nomads moved from one place to another. with their herd of animals as you can see in this picture the herd and the one who's controlling this herd taking their animals from one place to another they survived 
on milk products and exchanged ghee, wool, etc., and with farmers for grains, cloth, utensils. For the better understanding, please have a look to these pictures. So, most important trader nomads were Banjaras. Their caravan was called Tand. They brought and sold these goods as they moved from one place to another and transporting them on their animals. So, as their name is Banjara, this term is quite clear that they used to move from one place to another so that they can bought and sold the goods and for the transportation they used their animals. Sultan Alauddin Khilji used Banjaras to move grain to the city markets. They transported food grain for the Mughal army during military campaigns. With a large army, there could be 1 lakh bullocks carrying grain. You can have an idea how big and famous community were Banjaras. Pastoral tribes basically reared and sold animals. You should know the difference between the nomads and pastorals. So pastoral tribes are the tribes who used to rear and sold animals like horses, cattle to the prosperous, to the rich classes in an ancient past. Pastoral tribes reared and sold animals like horses, cattle as you can see in the picture what kind of animals they used to rear to the rich classes in our ancient past. They made and sold wares such as ropes, reeds, straw matting, etc. Again, I want you to see the pictures so that you can understand these terms in a better way. They made and sold wares and sometimes mendicants acted as wandering merchants. They were cast of entertainers who performed in different towns and villages for their livelihood. Due to various economic and social developments, the demand for people with new skills increased. Smaller caste or jatis emerged within the world. Jati is considered one of the tribes and social groups that were included in the caste-based society. Like specialized artisans, smiths, carpenters, etc. Jatis become the basis of organization of these societies. New Rajput clans among the Kshatriyas which belong to the different lineages. For example, Chandelas, Chalukyas and others replace the older rulers especially in agricultural areas. A new and developed society emerged that had many powerful states. Leading tribal families gradually become the part of the caste system with the help of the Brahmins. But majority joined the lower jatis of caste society and many of them continued to reject the caste system completely. Here we are learning that how jatis and communities became the most important and the influential part of the society. Some people from the higher caste, from the higher jatis and some people are from the skilled jatis. So they all were grouped into different different jatis and they were ranked according to their occupation, background, skills, etc. So it was a new kind of a system emerged in our ancient past which we can call as new caste and hierarchies. So now let's just have a closer look the Gonds. Now who were they? Let's just understand. Due to the social changes that occurred in the different tribe, new states developed. The Gonds lived in the forested area of the Gondwana, which is the present-day Odisha. 
Gonds practiced shifting cultivation. Look at this picture carefully. They are telling you step by step. So what they used to do? It's an agricultural system. Which system? The shifting cultivation. In which plot of land are cultivated temporarily. They abandoned and allowed to grow naturally while the cultivator moves on to the another plot. The large Gon tribe was divided into smaller clans which had their own Rajas or Reis. Large Gon kingdom began to dominate the smaller Gon chiefs. The administrative system then became centralized as the kingdom was divided into Gras, which were ruled by the different Gon tribes. Gars were further divided into Chaurasis and it was the unit of 84 villages which were further divided into Barhots and that was the unit of the 12 villages. Due to the emergence of these new states, the Gon society began to be divided into unequal social classes. Gar Katang was a rich state. It was a large ad as it had 70,000 villages. It faced many invasions and was defeated by the Mughals. It means this rich state was captured by so many people. But at last they defeated by the Mughals. Still some of the Gon kingdom survived for some time but later they became weak. They were not able to survive for a longer period of a time. The emergence of large state changed the nature of Gon society. Their equal society slowly got divided into unequal social classes. Brahmins received land grants from the Gon Rajas and became more influential and more powerful. The Gon chiefs now wished to be recognized as Rajputs. Amandas, the Gon Raja of Garkatang, assumed the title of Sangram Shah. Now they tried to be developed, I would say more developed and more powerful. Now they themselves wanted to be recognized in a, from a different background or a society. Like here the Gon chiefs wanted to recognize as a Rajput. His son, Dalpat, married Princess Durgavati, one of the famous personality, women personality in our ancient past, the daughter of Salbahan, the Chandel Rajput Raja of Mahoba. Dalpat was died early, but Rani Durgavati was very capable and started ruling on behalf of her five-year-old son, Bir Naren. Under her, the kingdom became even more successful. In 1565, the Mughal forces under Asaf Jha, Asaf Khan, attacked Garkatang. Rani Durgavati had a fight with Mughal forces. So could you see how brave she was? She was defeated and preferred to die rather than surrender along with her son. Garkatang was a rich state. When the Mughals defeated the Gons, they captured huge precious coins and elephants. And I, th I think this, is, this was exactly happened whenever any war fought between the two kingdom or the two people. The one who got defeated hand over or to surrender everything that they have to the another one who won the war. They captured part of the kingdom and granted the rest of Chandrasha, an uncle of Bir Naren. Despite the fall of Garkatang, the Gon kingdom survived for some time. They became weaker and later struggled unsuccessfully against the stronger Bundelas and Marathas. Now we'll talk about and learn about the Ahoms. In the 13th century, the Ahoms migrated 
from regions of present day Myanmar to the Brahmaputra Valley. They established new states by suppressing the old political system of Bhuiyans, that is landlords, by conquering powerful kingdom like Ko Chajo in the 16th century and by subjugating many tribes. They used new and advanced ammunitions like the firearms. Could you imagine in the 1530 firearms and they began to make gunpowder and cannons by 1660s. You can have a look what kind of modern and advanced ammunition they have used. This is the cannon which were used by 1660s. The Ahom Kingdom faced many invasion from the southwestern areas of the Indian subcontinent. They were finally defeated by the Mughals in 1662, but could not be controlled for a long time. The system of forced labor was prevalent in the Ahom Kingdoms and these labors were called as pegs. A census or a survey was taken and the people from the more populated areas were transferred to the less populated areas. So the people were transferred from the more populated areas to the less populated area. Thus the Ahom clan or Khels that controlled many villages were broken up by the beginning of the 17th century. Their administration became almost centralized. The major occupation of the males of the kingdom was agriculture, construction of dams and other public works. Many new methods of rice cultivation were developed by the Ahoms. During the time of war, the males served in the armies, the Ahom worshipped their tribal gods originally. But during the mid 18th century, Hinduism became a predominant religion due to the rule of Hindu kings. That was very obvious if any king is ruling from a particular community, in that particular time period, that religion become the most dominant religion in the entire area or the subcontinent. Yet the Ahoms did not adopt Hinduism completely. In the Ahom kingdom, art and literature flourished. Various translation works were carried out from Sanskrit into the local languages. I hope you have understood the chapter. So that's all for today. Have a nice day ahead. Take care.